Apparently yesterday, uh, a member of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife spotted Chris Dorner driving in Big Bear. Uh, and then, I don't know how it got to that point, but uh, LAPD learned that he was in a cabin and uh, he was barricaded in that cabin. And then all of a sudden, there was a fire and Chris Dorner's body, or it hasn't been confirmed yet, but a charred body emerged from that cabin after the fire was put out. Now, uh, ABC News has a bit of a timeline on this, so let's take a look at that and we'll discuss. After an all-day standoff filled with shootouts and drama, the week-long international manhunt for Christopher Dorner ended overnight in a blazing inferno. Sources tell ABC News it all started shortly after noon when a maid called 911, saying she and another worker had been tied up and held hostage by Dorner in a resort cabin. Remarkably, just a few yards from where police had been holding press briefings for nearly a week. Shut down the freeway, possibly uh, for the subject we've been looking for. This time in a shootout with two approaching sheriff's deputies. Dorner kills one and wounds another before once again fleeing. Then, less than an hour later, residents report the sound of gunfire at a nearby cabin. By 2 p.m., smoke is pouring out of the building, then flames. Shortly before 5, reports of a SWAT team approaching the fire in an armored vehicle and injecting gas into the cabin before reportedly peeling back the walls of that cabin like an onion. I mean, I hate, I hate that it had to end like that. Uh, and I'm, I'm not saying it had to end like that with the fire and everything, but another uh, police official was shot and killed. Uh, there was a, a gun battle and that's how it ended. Uh, one other police official uh, has been hospitalized. He had to undergo surgery as a result of a, a gun wound. Uh, I, it's a really tragic story, and I'm pretty sure that that's Chris Dorner's body. I mean, of yes. course, they haven't confirmed it, but Desi, what are your thoughts on the story? Well, there was about a, a press conference about uh, two hours ago before air, and one of the things that they did say was that they had found a charred driver's license, so that does make it seem like it was a Christopher Dorner's driver's license on what they were able to discern, so it does seem like it's going to be him. But what I found particularly surprising about this entire episode are the, the, the police procedures. Yes. It seems like you know there have been multiple missteps all along the way and we're talking just specifically about this particular chase manhunt that went on not about you know the reopening of the investigation into his initial firing you know that's a whole other big legacy that the LAPD has to deal with their issues with racism within the department and within the community of Los Angeles these are very well established on one hand you want to condemn Dorner for what he did and of course you want to condemn him what he did was wrong he didn't handle it correctly however that's not to say that there weren't parts of his manifesto that could have been legitimate um, and I'm glad that there is an investigation into his firing and I do want an investigation into some of the other accusations that were pointed out in his manifesto. And I think that the way the LAPD handled this particular case demonstrates that some of the uh, things in his manifesto were legitimate. It does, it does yeah. seem like they did react quite strongly, shall yes. we say? Now, yes. obviously, you know, people in a situation of fear like this, this, you know, it's hard to judge. We'll find out more as an investigation, which I am sure is going to happen, will be uh, brought up on the entire process of what happened. One of the things that they did say in the press conference was that they did not intend to set fire to the cabin, that they actually had sent in pyrotechnic tear gas but they didn't mean to set the place on fire. Yeah, so, so you, you make a good point about that because there is a lot of controversy stirring on the internet about a video, it's an unconfirmed, it's actually audio, unconfirmed audio uh, of the incident that happened yesterday. And it allegedly has police officers talking about how they're going to set the cabin on fire. Turn that whole wall down, that door and that window, make a big fourth window for me there. All right, Steve, we're gonna go, uh, we're gonna go forward with the plan with the, with the burner. Seven burners deployed and we have a fire. Copy, seven burners deployed and we have a fire. You guys, be ready on the number four side. We have fire in the front. He might come out the back. It sounds sound like one shot fired from inside the residence. Copy, one shot fired from inside the residence. Confirming you still want fire to roll in? Roll in and stay. That is a telling piece of audio. Indeed. Uh, and again, I do want to... Uh, mention again that it's unconfirmed, but if cops did intentionally set the cabin on fire, you have some issues there. Yeah. Because 
we don't prosecute people anymore in this country. I mean, we, de we certainly don't prosecute when it comes to people that uh, have done us wrong uh, and they're abroad, right? I mean, we've kind of set a precedent with that, but I don't want to do that here in the United States as well. Well, no, and it's, it's an interesting idea. Why did they have to set the cabin on fire? Why did they have to smoke him out right now? I mean, again, we don't know if they set it on fire on purpose or not, but I should clarify that. But why did they have to smoke him out of the, of the cabin so fast? I mean, he, he, didn't, he didn't kill the maids that he could have. He didn't actually harm anyone that he could have. He could have, uh, he could have killed those maids and disappeared, and they would never have known that he was right across the street from them. He did not do that, and yet they went ahead and went in and tried to smoke him out fast. He would have exited the cabin eventually. Someday, you would yeah, think, yeah. you know, at so, some point. So what was the rush? Yeah, so I don't, I'm not sure I agree. If it is confirmed at some point that the LAPD used this strategy, I, I'm not sure I agree with the strategy, but this is how the case ended. And of course, there will be updates. I'm sure at some point there'll be a confirmation that that charred body was the body of Christopher Dorner. Another manifesto that was written by an ex-LAPD uh, officer by the name of Joe Jones. Now, Joe Jones posted this manifesto Manifesto on his Facebook page and he was very clear in condemning Christopher Dorner for what he did okay so he is not in favor of killing killing innocent individuals uh, in retaliation of how the LAPD treated ex cops um, but he does say some things that were really interesting and I want to read them to you he says the first thing I would say to Dorner is I feel your pains but you are going about this the wrong way to take innocent lives could never be the answer to anything I say this as a man who experienced the same pain betrayal anger suffering litigation and agony that you did in many ways. He continues to write, I need you to first assume that I would not surface 16 years later with lies about a situation that has me with PTSD to this very day. The pain forces me to speak as I have yet to shake the ills of my experience as an LAPD officer. So a lot of people, uh, are talking about this now and the fact that another individual has come forward, another black police official or ex-police official from the LAPD is coming forward and talking about his treatment. I mean, I really hope that there is at least an internal investigation to see whether or not there's mistreatment. Happening. I would think that there would have to be at this point. I mean, one of the things that is well known within most police departments, and especially even within the Los Angeles Police Department, something that Dorner had mentioned was the blue code of silence, where they don't talk about each other, they don't uh, tell on each other, essentially. And I think that that is also something that has enabled the uh, racial conflicts that we have heard about over the last several decades with the LAPD, that has enabled those conflicts to continue because they don't ever get aired out. And obviously, you know, Los Angeles the communities, especially the communities around the downtown police departments, you know, those communities have big problems with the Los Angeles Police Department because of past police, police brutality. You know, one of the things that came up that I thought was very interesting about the response has been the social media response. A lot of people have gone on to Dorner's Facebook page and this uh, ex-cops Facebook page as well to offer support for them. Not that they're supporting that he killed innocent people, but supporting that somebody finally got some revenge essentially against a system that had wronged him. So it's, it's a very interesting and culturally significant, I think, event that, you know, we'll find out hopefully more later on about what his mental state was, what actually happened in his employment, what actually happened afterward, and what's really going on in the LAPD. And it's really a shame because the of course, the majority of police officers put their lives on the line to protect yes. us. And yes. usually the negative aspects of any police uh, department always gets covered by the media. So I just want to take a moment to say that, of course, not all members of the LAPD are corrupt and hateful individuals. The majority of them do protect us. They do want to look out for us. I just hope that they do an investigation and reveal whatever faults they have and do whatever they can to improve. Because if you don't, then all of a sudden, you know, your department is going to get painted in the most negative possible way.